Okay, yeah. good evening and welcome to <laughs> evening. Well, it's almost evening, isn't it? Afternoon. Afternoon. And welcome to Birmingham. Gosh, that's very loud. Welcome to Birmingham Repertory Theatre. This event's going to last about an hour, so by half past five you will be away. I'm going to initially give an overview in terms of what we're, we're talking about. Um, we're going to focus particularly around how policing has changed uh, and what does the future hold. Uh, once I've done a slight intro, each of the panel members is going to talk for about five minutes. We've got no politicians here, uh, so hopefully they won't go much longer than that. <laughs> um, and in terms of talking time, uh, then once we bring it back, I'll ask a few questions and then we'll open up to the floor uh, so that you have the opportunity to ask questions. Please make those questions questions and not statements uh, and as clear as possible, please. So we're joined today on the panel by Katie Bourne, who's a police and crime commissioner for Sussex. Peter Walker, sorry, Matthew Grove is the police and crime commissioner from Humberside. He stood in at the last minute. You'll see that someone is absent. Um, that person that's absent uh, has stated over the weekend that he's going to leave the Conservative and join UKIP. Uh, that's Mark Reckless, uh, which is uh, a shame because I think that um, I certainly had a number of questions for him, and I'm sure other people did. But anyway, he's. Uh, Matthew stood in to take his place. To my left is Peter Walker, the former Deputy Chief Constable of North Yorkshire, and then Sir Hugh Ward, the President of the Association of Chief Police Officers. So what are the challenges in terms of policing? Well, policing has changed. We're now in 21st century policing, and alongside that, technology has changed. And technology plays a huge part in policing. And it works for both sides in terms of the advantages for the offenders. Offenders now use technology in as much as 80% of crimes investigated by police have some element of technology involved in it. Um, for example, one of those big elements, I think, of policing, which at the moment is certainly underreported and certainly under-investigated, is an area of white-collar crime. And some of that is because of the way that offenders are committing those crimes. Um, and I'll explain in a minute, I think that some of that technology presents challenges for police. But also the flip side is, is, of course, it assists the police. The police now have an ability to use technology because technology leaves a trail, that trail of evidence enabling uh, the police to go looking, child abusers in particular, uh, and also in relation to terrorism. Some of those elements now in terms of changed methodology enables the police to focus and get uh, evidence. But one of the biggest challenges, I think, in terms of technology for police, is to come to terms with some of the simple stuff, some of the social media, some of those elements in terms of the information and the gateway. And I still think that in terms of policing, there's the frontline police officers still have a lot to get up to in terms of some of the offenders uh, and how readily available technology is being used by them. But the biggest problem, I think, around policing is the huge cuts and the huge cuts in terms of staff, the lack of trained officers, the de-skilling of officers. Um, and whilst the government have been very clear that frontline policing isn't affected by it, frontline policing only is effective in terms of investigating crime if it's supported by the back-end elements of policing, the investigators, the scenes of crime. So that whilst frontline policing might stay fairly similar in terms of the numbers being applied to it, if you lose the back end, you will start to see crime figures plummet. Uh, sorry, crime detections plummet. plummet. But the biggest challenges, I think, in terms of policing is around tradecraft, is around learning some of the skills. Policing can't be taught from a textbook. You can't learn policing in a classroom. Um, and nothing beats being able to go out and do it on the job. And some of those challenges, certainly as, terms, as far as uh, recruitment into the middle ranks, present some of those challenges. But in addition, some of those challenges, I hope, will be met by the creation of the College of Policing. The College of Policing is looked to tackle some of those issues, uh, and I hope that over time that will start to, uh, to show benefit. But before I hand over to panel members, I think the most important thing is to acknowledge the benefit and the quality of the police that we have here in the UK. I think we have one of the best policing structures in the world. I've travelled the country, and I'm indeed many of my colleagues have, and if you go to other countries, you are held up in high regard and high esteem by the British, by the police forces in other countries, who look to 
emanate some of the policing structures. They take some of the models that are used within here to, to replicate, and some of those are years and years behind, but it's come from a policing structure. So whilst I totally understand the policing cuts, there is a need for change, we must not forget the legacy. Um, let's, we need to fight to keep what the policing structure is about. The police are there to and for the public. And whilst we must meet their needs, we must make sure that we are meeting those people's needs and not the needs of the politicians. So let me first start uh, opening up the panel, who are going to set around five minutes in terms of what they're going to talk about. And the first person who's going to talk is Katie. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to stand up because I'm so short. I'm sinking in that seat, so I can see you all now. Sorry, um, is that okay sound-wise? It's ringing up here. Perfect. Um, well, I was told uh, future of policing, but um, I suppose really on reflection as a police and crime commissioner, I represent physically the biggest reform to policing that this country's ever seen since policing began. And, um, and it's a reform for two main reasons. Before police and crime commissioners came in, you would have um, policing priorities set by government, and they were delivered locally by your chief constable in 41 forces up and down the country. And he or she was held to account by a police authority. Um, and the police authority was made up in Sussex, where I represent, was made up of 17 local county councillors. Um, there were two independent members, but the majority were from the local county councils, the three of them, uh, county councils that is. And, um, and their job was to make sure that policing was delivered. So national priorities set by policing were delivered locally under the chief constable. They were responsible for the budget and, um, and pretty much they were there also to connect with the public. Now in Sussex, they didn't do too bad a job, but um, the one area they failed, and this is true of all police authorities up and down the country, was that the public didn't know who they were. So when I go out and speak to the public now, nearly two years into my term of office, and I say to them, two years ago, if you had an issue in policing, who would you go to? The majority of people in the audience would say, I'd speak to my local PCSO if it was something local to me, or maybe the sergeant or the local divisional commander, or if it was really important, I'd write an angry of Sussex letter to the chief constable, or I'd maybe take it to the IPCC, the Independent Police Complaints Commission. But nobody, but nobody would have taken their complaint to the police authority. They didn't realise that there was somebody there to represent them. But now there is. There is me. There is a police and crime commissioner. Um, and my job is now, instead of strategy being set by government, so national strategy delivered locally, my job now is to set the strategy for policing locally to reflect what people want. So if you were residents of Sussex, I would be listening to what it is you th think are the problems in policing, where you want to see policing go in your county. And I would make sure that that is reflected in the police and crime plan that I write. So that's one big, big difference to, to the change that we bring in. The other one is that under the police authority, if you didn't like the direction in which they were taking policing, the decisions they were making, you had no way of actually changing that. But you do now with me. Because under the old police authority, those members, the 17, who were taken from our three top tier authorities, when they got to the county council, people would say, well, you're going to sit, Charlie, you'll go on scrutiny, Claire, you can go on education, and Bill, you'll go on the police authority. So you had this group of councillors who were never directly elected to represent you on the police authority. And if you didn't like what they were doing, there was nothing you could do about it. But now you can. If you don't like the decisions that I make in policing, if you don't like the decisions I make around spending your taxpayers' money, if you don't like the priorities that are being written, at the next election, 2016, you can vote for somebody else. And you can completely change that. You couldn't do that until police and crime commissioners came in. So two really fundamental changes, and that's why this uh, position is such a big reform and really heralds the future for policing up and down the country, I believe. Now, granted, and I'm sure we'll come on to it later, there have been um, a few police and crime commissioners who've fallen very, very short of public expectations. And should they, should they be accountable? And should the public have an opportunity to remove them if they want? Absolutely. 
And we, as a collective group on all sides, all of our political um, parties, are working with the Home Office and the Home Secretary at the moment to see how we can enact that. Because that's absolutely right. If the public feel that someone has fallen short and they're in a position of such responsibility, you as members of the public should have a way of actually removing that person. That said, there are 41 of us. And I can honestly say, hand on heart, across the political divide, there is some really, really good work going on out there. So we're going to probably talk about the future of policing throughout this event, and I'm sure you'll have lots of questions. I'm not going to rabbit on for much longer. Um, my colleague Matthew is here. He didn't expect to be sitting in a vacant seat, but I'm really delighted he is here because um, I'm sure he'll have a few words he wants to say. But please, you know, later on, do ask questions, particularly of us, challenge us. I don't care how contentious they are, give us the opportunity to address your concerns. I'd rather you did that than leave the room tonight feeling that, mm, well, you know, it was okay, but those two on the left, they were a bit... Mm. Let us actually address your concerns and, and challenge us. And, uh, and I'm sure you'll see that uh, this is a great benefit for everybody. So thank you for your time. And, um, thank you, Katie. Very good. Yes, let's Perfect. pass it. Thank you for stepping into the, uh, the fold. Katie, <coughs> you're too kind and you're too polite uh, in your support for the uh, activities of the former police authorities because I disagree with you. I think they were appallingly bad at actually uh, holding the police to account and setting priorities that were meaningful to local people. So how can I say that? Well, I've got a host of examples, but let me just give you a, a, a few. Why is it that I discovered in my force area that we had the same number of police officers on duty at 7 o'clock in the morning as we did at 7 o'clock at night? But guess what? At 7 o'clock at night, we had four times the level of demand for services from the police by the public. You know, would a shop do that? Would it have the same number of staff on duty in the middle of the night as it does? No. That means that they were not able to respond appropriately to the needs of the public. Why was it that uh, the busiest month for policing, uh, when most crimes are committed and there's the greatest need for the police to respond to help the public in my area, that's August. Guess which month had the lowest number of police officers on duty able to come to the assistance of the public? Yep, you've got it. It's August. There are a whole range of issues like that. Um, the fact is, the police authority didn't ask the question. And if you don't ask the right questions, you are not going to be able to come up with the answers that actually uh, encourage the police to, to uh, improve. And you're not going to maximise the service that your residents get. Um, the police are there to protect the public as best they can with the resources they've got available. And quite simply, I don't think the, uh, the police authority uh, enabled that to happen. The other issue, uh, and it's absolutely self-evident, the police authority as representatives of the public were so invisible, the public, locally and nationally, didn't even know they existed. So that when uh, police and crime commissioners, we were invented to solve the problem, the public didn't even know they had a problem. So they saw us as an additional layer of bureaucracy, an additional cost. Um, well, we weren't. We were a replacement for something that was very expensive and was invisible. Now, we, uh, whether you're a police authority, a quango, you're there to make political decisions. You decide, basically, to take money out of people's pockets through the police precept. That is inherently a political decision. And to do that invisibly, with no means of the public to truly hold them to account, was nothing short of a disgrace. Um, I am also uh, really pleased to see the difference that we have made. Because the public now know they have somebody who is, if you like, responsible for overseeing policing, they know our name, they largely know our faces, because we are in the press all the time. Um, they know we are there to serve them. And they have come forward quite literally in their thousands. And they have brought issues that the police were not aware of. They've actually said that to me. Matthew, we didn't know we were doing some of these things. And if you want an example of the sort of things the police were doing, I once got taken to one side at, at, at a function by a, a mother who was at her wit's end. She had four children, uh, and the eldest 
was going off to senior school. Little Tilly, 11 years old. And uh, little Tilly's dad, the father of the four children, uh, the previous year had committed suicide. Off she went to school, to big school. And in, that, uh, in her class, unfortunately, there was a little lad who decided that he was going to bully her. And what he said to her was, the reason your dad killed himself is because you're fat and ugly. Little Tilly, being an 11-year-old, responded in the only way she, she, she could think of. She saw what was in front of her. And unfortunately, in, re, in her reprisal, she referred to her, his mixed race. She found herself being interviewed under caution by police officers. Is that what the public want their police officers used for? Was that serving anybody? Was it helping anybody? No. Why did they do it? They did it because I honestly believe that policing nationally has been corrupted. It's been corrupted, first of all, by performance indicators, performance targets, centrally set, irrelevant, and it's been infected by political correctness. The reason those officers responded in that way was because they were terrified because of an overreaction to other scandals that have happened nationally. I don't have to name them. They thought, oh, hang on, it's race. We've got to do this. And they have ceased to use what makes British policing so special and so valuable. And that is officer discretion, which we would all call common sense. Common sense has been stripped out of policing, it's been stripped out of the public services in general. And I am on a mission, I am elected to make sure for the people of my area that common sense is re-injected back into local policing. And that means I need to make sure that warranted police officers, constables and sergeants, the people that are really delivering to protect the public of my area, are allowed to use judgment, professional judgment, common sense. And I, I'm on a mission to do that. I think I'm succeeding. I'm definitely connecting to the public. So I was able to sort the little silly issue out. Solving that problem for her and her family was not the main win for that. It was actually raising this issue that we end up doing the wrong things because we have replaced common sense and professional judgment with systems with targets, with procedures and protocols that are totally inappropriate and have damaged the relationship between British policing and the public that they're there to serve and are paying for it. So that's my introduction. Um, I'm very passionate about it. I like to focus on doing what I can locally, but it's great to have someone like Sir Hugh Ward here so we can have a bit of a, a, bit of a sword fight and, uh, and see where we end up. So thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, you might wonder why some old bloke is here, having retired years ago from the police. Um, I, have to, I have to say, um, it may have something to do with the fact that um, I spend quite a lot of time writing about uh, policing, which doesn't mean that I'm a sad guy with thick rimmed glasses and no girlfriend. Uh, what, it, what it does mean is that I still take an interest in what I did for many years. I've also been involved with particularly uh, Theresa May's special advisor in terms of nursing this program of change forward. Um, I wrote just after the elections for police and crime commissioners that we could expect to see a normal distribution curve emerge where you would have some that were outstanding, the vast majority would be there or thereabouts, uh, some would be mediocre and quite frankly some would simply not be, not be up to the job. Uh, and funnily enough, statistical prevalence has happened. Um, and there are some that are truly not up to the job. What you've just heard is on that analysis, two who, who are on the left-hand side in the probably two of the best-known police and crime commissioners in the country uh, who have gone about things in a fundamentally different way. One example, Matthew, uh, hangs around Tesco's, uh, not looking for the, the value baked beans or other bargains, even though, like me, he's from Yorkshire. But the, um, uh, the, the simple fact of the matter is, he meets his public there. You may have read in the newspapers the Devon and Cornwall Police and Crime Commissioner 
pictured in a hall where one person turned up. Well, if you continue to have meetings like my old police authority used to have on a cold Tuesday evening when Corrie's on, okay, uh, then you're going to have one person turn up. And they're going to want to talk about the fact that their neighbour's dog is doing poos on their front lawn, you know, as they go by in the morning. And that's it. The police and crime commissioners, in most cases, have sought to be really strategic. And what they have come up against is a whole stream, and I say this as a, as a live member of, uh, of the ACPO, uh, with Sir Hugh here, um, but they have come up in the main against a whole stream of just obstacle after obstacle after obstacle. You think that Michael Gove faces difficulty in pushing through education reform, just see how many Home Secretaries before Theresa May backed off in the face of opposition from the Police Federation. Okay, the, there is a blob in policing and police and crime commissioners on many occasions have been facing it. There are some classic myths that need to be dispelled. Matthew was talking about shift systems. I started in Weymouth on the beat in 1973. Officers came on at six and came on at eight in 1973 in Weymouth to spread the resources. I went to Kent as a superintendent in 1990. My staff had, there was hell to pay. I said, why do we have everybody starting at six? Start at eight, start at nine, because that's when the phone starts to ring. Matthew is still in that situation where he's fighting to get that across in 2014. In 2000, sorry, in 1999, North Yorkshire Police, where I was deputy chief, went from paying the staff every four weeks to paying the staff every month. Matthew and I were talking about this. He's now fighting that battle, ladies and gentlemen. There's a blob. It's across the whole of the public sector, and it's certainly there in police. Myths. A good police officer would always be complained against. Rubbish. A rude police officer is complained against. Okay, and that will then be investigated far more than the theft from your vehicle, far more than the burglary at your house. That will be investigated by a senior officer. Okay, your burglary in your house will be dealt with in some cases over the telephone. I'll get on to that in a minute. But the, the fact of the matter is that the complaint will be investigated within an inch of its life. The officer eventually will be uh, interviewed about six months later. And that officer will say, oh, it wasn't like that at all. That complaint will be unsubstantiated. You'll get a letter from a senior police officer saying, your complaint is unsubstantiated. What did you want to happen? What used to happen back in 1973 when PC Walker walked back into the police station clutching a ticket, put it in the process tray, the sergeant grabbed you, literally, I have to say, by the ear at that stage, took you into a room and said, I've had a phone call about the way you spoke to that motorist. Don't let that happen again. The motorist had already been told what the motorist wanted to hear, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry, I'll have a word with the officer. And funnily enough, the majority of complaints made against police officers are they're rude, they're late, they get things wrong. Well, funnily, they do get things wrong. I disagree. I, I respect the work that you've done, but I have to say I disagree. When people say, myth number two, you cannot learn policing from a book, where do you think they wrote the Burglary Act? In a book. Yeah? I had uh, an offence committed at uh, my son's flat down in York, or rather, there was an offence committed at my son's flat down in York. The officer who, who attended did not know the definition of burglary. Okay? There was a fantastic book called The Signs of Crime, written by a chap called David Paris in the late 1960s, about how to spot street crime. I read it, I was made passionate about some of the things that were done in that book. One of them was, always read the number plates of cars coming towards you when you're going to a job. Because funnily enough, one of them might be a car going away from the job. My wife thinks this is sad, I still do that today. But the number of times, I still do it. You know, I know my, my friend's car number plates, oh I saw you at Sunset. You know, oh, how did you do it? Well, I saw your car number, don't worry, it's a walker thing. You know, but the fact of the matter is, drilling those street craft things into police offices is essential. Let us hope the College of Policing is going to do that. All of these things where people say, you know, the old myths of policing, they've got to change. 
Because, ladies and gentlemen, you will have heard George this morning. We've cut the deficit by a third. Well, yippee, we've got another two thirds to go. And everybody in the public sector has been saying for the last two years, the sky will fall in. Okay, but we've got another two thirds to go. The police and crime commissioners who've been doing so well across the country have been saving money, have been grinding out the efficiencies, have been facing a huge amount of opposition. There have been some dumb things done by some police and crime commissioners. But we have to really, really think hard about where we're going in after the next election as we deliver the rest of the deficit reduction in terms of our public services. And we have to think about what the public expect for what they pay in council tax and income tax. And so from that point of view, I have to say, living in North Yorkshire, where frankly, now happens, okay, not much happens where I live. There's about 16 crimes a year in Beedale, okay. There are 35, 40,000 crimes in the whole of North Yorkshire. It takes nearly three hours to drive across North Yorkshire. In the whole of North Yorkshire, there's about 30,000 crimes a year. There's 1,200 police officers. Do the maths, most police go to 30 crimes a year. They now have started dealing with them over the telephone. I, and we had a crime at my business. I run a training business. And we, so we had this situation. We had a crime at the business. And I was told, oh, the police won't attend that. We'll deal with it over the telephone. Now, I can understand that in part, OK? But the officer said to me something, oh, yes, there's lots of crimes we don't go to. For example, we don't go and look at the dry patch on the road where the car was before it was stolen. And I said, well, hang on a second. Actually, that tells you a lot of things. If you know when it stopped raining, you have a pretty good idea of the time when the car had gone by. Secondly, in North Yorkshire, you can do something I do in the business, because we cross-sell all the time. So you can go and do door-to-door -door inquiries, because you're only dealing with 35 crimes a year, you're on duty 225 times. You know, you've got plenty of time to go and do this. Go along and see them, see the people in the street, and while you're at it, say, are you in Neighbourhood Watch? Because when somebody comes to my business, we always ask them if they want something else. Even when you go to McDonald's, somebody in a funny hat will say to you, do you want fries with that? Okay, so you go and do your house-to-house -house inquiries, you say, would you like to join Neighbourhood Watch? If somebody's in Neighbourhood Watch, you say, have you ever thought of being a special constable? All of these things that the police need to be looking at in the future, need to be drawing in some business experience, need to be dealing with, as Matthew said, with common sense. And above all, ladies and gentlemen, meeting the needs of the public, because you're all paying for it. Thank you, Peter. See you. Thank you. Rules to stand. I've never been described as a blob before, Peter. I'm grateful for that. <laughs> um, and I'm not sure if you talk about Section 91A or 91B of Berkeley, but I can tilt. I'll give you a definition of both. And most police officers, let me assure you, ladies and gentlemen, understand what a crime is. They know what a burglary is, they know what to respond to, they know what they cannot respond to because they're simply uh, too busy. But looking forward, I think was the brief we had today, Mark, um, PCCs have covered with, a, with, with admirable um, depth their role. Uh, the role of a police officer is, of course, to be held to account. And how we're held to account has to be and must be a matter of the government, not for the police service. So we have no issue with police and crime. So I'm uh, crossing swords, Matthew. I'm not sure we have to. One bit that's sort of missing, I think, looking forward, is the growing... Yeah, the growing importance of how we deal with the national threats at a national level, and of course, within the Act is the strategic policing requirement, the national policing requirement, which ensures police and crime commissioners hold us to account for the totality of policing, not just what they do in their local areas. And that's critical, because frankly, uh, dealing with a new terrorist threat, which is something fundamentally different to the uh, last century when uh, Peter was a cop, uh, the way we deal with the IRA is fundamentally different to the way we deal with ISIS. We, we are seeing, uh, we, we see asymmetric terrorism. Um, I had the privilege of being a chief in Northern Ireland for seven years. We knew how to deal with that threat. It was obviously our post that threat with the emerging distant Republican threat. We were very good at infiltrating that sort of structure. Now we have people who don't know they're terrorists wandering around this country and may or may not have come back from Syria yet, who suddenly decide to create uh, a some sort of bomb on the internet and place it in some place of high population. That cannot be dealt with just nationally, locally. 
although locally has a critical role to play, and that's around neighbourhood policing, which every PCC remains committed to. And one of the great strengths of our model is having a neighbourhood, the strength of neighbourhood that builds an intelligence picture to what is now a completely different terrorist threat in this country. So I think there's lots to look forward to and lots of challenges we face. And the chief officers are up for that. Um, it's not me saying we have a last unreformed uh, public service. Indeed, Damien Green, the last policing minister, said he refused to use that phrase anymore <coughs> because he absolutely accepted we'd risen to the challenge. The Home Secretary described us as a model public service in dealing with the cuts which have been touched on. Uh, we have delivered the 26% that we have been asked to deliver. We fully understand the need for cuts in public service uh, across the piece. And whilst we are but, what, 0.8 of 1% of total public expenditure, everyone has to take their fair share, and we are doing that. My frustrations looking forward, um, and my colleagues, uh, my friends on the uh, panel will know this well, I have consistently argued for five years we have too many forces. You can deliver neighbourhood policing with far less forces and far less uh, top, you know, top management, some of the stuff Peter touched on, uh, and deliver local policing. The public want to know who their local police leader is. Uh, if you look at Scotland, that's exactly what's happening. They're building from the bottom up. So the, the basic command units and then building up to see what you need at the top to manage those threats that we're seeing uh, rising here, and those are around cybercrime, already touched on, uh, and indeed terrorism, uh, which I have touched on. So I think we need to look at that structure looking forward. The last time they looked at that was 1962, it was the Royal Commission, uh, interesting piece of work. Um, certainly, I'm, in fact, one of the reasons it came across was the sacking of the Chief Constable in Brighton, as it was at the time, if I remember correctly. But even in 62, when that review took place, it said we're looking at a model for the next few decades, not the next century. It was looked at before colour television, never mind the internet, never mind email, never mind moving money around the world in a nanosecond. It's a fundamentally different set of challenges we face uh, in, in policing currently. My argument is we have too many forces. Uh, that's not to say neighbourhood policing isn't a critical element and must always remain a critical element, not because it's flaky and nice and fluffy. It's sort of important. I speak as a victim of crime only last week, but I can now speak to my police and crime commissioner uh, about that. Um, not a major crime, I would accept £3.60, but very important to me. Yeah, so I do think that's... You don't get specialist treatment. I was disappointed in that. I was hoping I might. But yeah, I, but I think, don't, don't, please don't sense that we're not turning up to that which is not important. Public sectors have been cut across the piece. Um, this Home Secretary has been very effective in raising the awareness of the amount of time we are spending on mental health issues. Yeah, there is far less money in the mental health support networks. We have officers taking victims to hospital uh, because there's no ambulances. We are, we are covering, as a service of last resort, far more than just the crime fighting uh, which has been touched on. Critical though it is in our key mission. So lots to look forward to. Big challenges ahead. We are fully aware there's the cuts. There are more cuts to come. Um, one of the ways of taking some heat out of that cut, although not the only way, is to be more efficient by having less organisations to manage that bureaucracy and that decision making. Uh, the collaboration we, we hear about and we see, and lots of that is going on, is by definition suboptimal and will not deliver uh, against the next cuts. But apart from that, and the definition of burglary, which I'll rehearse uh, with Peter and theft and assault and all the other things, if you like, Peter, because we did learn, we did learn that by rote. We just didn't understand it. Uh, now I think the new cops uh, understand it as well as can repeat it by rote. But thank you. Thank you, Sir Hugh. So we'll open up to questions. I thought we'd just start with a, a, a question individually for each of the panel members. Um, in terms of the turnout for elections of police and crime commissioners, 15%, is so a very small percentage as far as turnout. And obviously very high profile Sean Wright has come to attention in terms of the public very outspoken saying that the man should go. He did eventually go. But surely there is a dichotomy here in terms of if they're there to serve the public, but the very people who don't want him to be in position have no power over getting rid of him because there is no position to be able to get rid of him, and surely something's gone wrong. Well, you've, you've touched on three issues there. The first one was, what's a mandate? So the turnout in Sussex uh, bucked the national trend. We were higher, it was 15.8%, go Sussex. Um, what is, I'm not what sure is, that's particularly big. What is, a, is what is a mandate? One vote, a thousand votes, a hundred thousand votes, a million votes. I can tell you in my locality, nearly 200,000 people turned out to vote. That's a huge number of people wanting to make a change. If, if Scotland, the referendum's taught us anything on both sides, we've learned that people are really keen to exercise their democratic right to effect change. So from that point of view, um, I, I think you know, the, the argument around the turnout is really mute. Um, I would love to have the debate about bringing in mandatory voting. 
Um, but that's that's a debate for the other one you said was around short. So you were happy with fifteen point eight percent as a well, turnout? Well, what's a what's a mandate? One vote? A thousand? A hundred thousand? You tell me. What if makes you're you there, just if you're there for the public and only 15.8% yeah. 15 okay, turn out, then are they really interested in voting people, or do they not know? You, you do not have a gun held to your head saying you have to vote. People choose to vote, they choose not to vote. Either way, they have that democratic right, and that's what they get with police and crime commissions. The other one you came to was Sean Wright. Um, my, my question here is, he was not held up to account for what he'd done as a police and crime commissioner. He was held to account. Let's not forget why he, we had the issues around him. It's because of what he did when he was lead member for children's services at the council. And there's been a really clever way that the, um, the opposition party turned it around and focused it all on being a PCC. Actually, what were they doing selecting him into that role in the first place? Okay, but the, the issue is, is how to get rid of a PCC when they fail. Well, I... The, the whole reason... Well, now, how do you get rid of a PCC? You get rid of them at the ballot box at the moment. Okay. The same way as you get and, rid of an MP. And does that need to change? Um, I, I believe yes. I believe it's the same for anybody, and I said this before. Anybody in a position of that responsibility in public life, there should be a mechanism available to the public that when they hit a certain criteria, if the public want them removed, there should be a mechanism for it. I firmly believe that, but I'm speaking personally here. Um, but you know that's the same. That's the same for MPs as well. Because currently, you 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 you, you know you, you remove people at the ballot box. We have a four-year term. Um, it wasn't brought in the power to recall because there's some issues around it. But they are looking at that now to see how they can enact it. And I'm really supportive. Of that. Matthew, thank you, Matthew. Can I just ask you one thing in terms of the police authority? You were very critical of the police authority and said that it had seriously failed. Your example that he used was in relation to timings of staff, 7 o'clock in the morning, 7 o'clock at night. But actually, that's not a failing of the police authority, that's a failing of divisional commanders, surely? No, no, we are there to hold them to account. My role is to make sure that the money that is uh, provided by the public to keep them safe is being spent in the optimum way, that the service is as good as it can be with the money we have available, and, and not to simply always default to saying, we need more money, because that is, that is just not realistic. Um, and as for the issue of, uh, of recall, I have publicly, repeatedly called for recall. There's two things we need to do uh, to improve the model. First of all, we do need recall. We, we need, and we should have it, I think, for all elected positions, not just police and crime commissioners. And the second thing is we have to reduce the cost of democracy in this country. It is too expensive, and we, we have too many ele elected individuals. If you look at the number of councillors, far too many. And, and the cost of elections. Why hold um, an election on its own for a police and crime commissioner? Just simply make them at the same time as a European or a general, and the cost will go down from one and a half to two million pounds per commissioner down to probably around about hundred thousand pounds. And guess what? Turnout will go up. Democracy will be improved. We need super election days um, so everybody can come out and. and, and we, you know, we, we have elections, every, it seems, every other month, isn't it? It's, it, it? Is there any wonder? And the other thing I would point out is that the turnout in homicide was actually, was the highest in the country. And that, and that is because they had a reason, because they, knew, they didn't know who they wanted as their police and crime commissioner, to be, to be fair, but they knew who they didn't want. <laughs> so what was that, 15.9? No, it was 19.2. So, yeah, it was, it was above 19%. Brilliant. Peter, um, in terms of explaining uh, textbook, of course, learning definitions is a key element of policing. Um, it's, in, it's how you then apply that. Um, I recently spoke to my class and she was at home when some burglars came to a house and she was inside the house and she picked up a knife, burglars were outside and she gestured to them. She was told by the police officer that she could be prosecuted for an offensive weapon. <laughs> Okay, clearly we all know that actually that isn't the case. And my question really is, is around, do you think that things have changed in the position of where we are now, whereby police officers aren't necessarily getting those definitions? I remember my sergeant on a Sunday morning, quiet Sunday morning, early shift, I had to go through all my definitions with him. Now, whether that's right or wrong in terms of policing, it meant that I knew my definitions 100% when it came to a case. Do you think that policing today has the background and the core education in terms of being in a position to 
know the, know the offences that they're dealing with and apply them? I, I think the, just like all other aspects of education, there has been something called modernisation over the years. Um, and a function of that has been, if, if it's more like homogenization of the process. Um, there was a time when uh, young police, I suspect you're one of them, Hugh, like you, Mark, you know, did actually learn the definitions of various offences. And somebody came along with, just like I did at school, I learnt the catechism and I learnt the times tables and those sort of things. And then somebody came along and said, oh, actually, we need a more intuitive way of doing this, where by some process of osmosis, you learn your times tables. And they did the same in policing. You know, they did it all practically. Answer. And they applied a whole load of different teaching theory to it. There is a bit about having the core. But I, I, what I would like to say is this, in terms of the implementation of the policy that directly led to the poor turnout in the November election, let's remember why that is and let's recognise what went wrong. First of all, the policy I don't think was really understood by the political players voting in Parliament or certainly in um, the three political parties of how they would go forward to those elections. The Liberal Democrats played the coalition card because they were desperate not to go into any elections. They played the coalition card and forced the elections back into the November. That was the recipe for poor turnouts to happen. Thirdly, in terms of selection processes, across the piece, I'm not sure that political parties generally understood what they were selecting for and the models didn't work out. In some cases they were astonishingly right, in others cases they weren't. The final bit about any electoral system, ladies and gentlemen, you toy with the fact that somebody's been elected at your peril to democracy. Okay? People have been elected at the ballot box. Other people won't like it. There's folk up in Scotland now who are saying, oh, we're the 45%. Yeah, I'm sorry, you lost. Get over it. It was a democratic ballot. And whether it was all 15% or whatever, they were hard-fought elections. But the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, you will never cater for a dishonourable politician who's been elected without the right of recall. We don't have it yet in this country. Okay, the final bit I'd say is I agree entirely with Matthew. I think even the Americans can organise, selecting more than one post in a single day. Surely we can. Surely we can. Thank you. So Hugh, in terms of policing, when, certainly when I was uh, policing, is that the police seem to be the fall, the catch for everything. You know, moving from the position whereby someone gets locked out of the car, you go and help them with the car. You know, we're now moved into a position where cuts are having a huge impact on policing. Do you think we're moving to a position where we're going to have a cut off and say, do you know what, no longer can police do that? Well, I, uh, policing is certainly coming under um, increasing pressure to the sort of shrinking of places. Um, I don't disagree with that at all. And as a service of the last resort, it's very hard for cops to say no. I might only hedge against that. My concern is, you know, if we start saying no, that has a huge impact on confidence in policing. Because we are seen as, you know, we, can, we will, and cops generally want to go and help people. So the, the trick is to make sure by working, you know, taking a far more emphasis on the partnership approach, working with you know, police and crime to put other people under pressure and say, look, you've got to come up, step up to the mark here. Um, yeah, we have a concordat now with the mental health authorities. You can have as much paper as you want, you can have a concordat. If the person doesn't turn up within their allotted time to take the mental health person away from the place of safety, which is the police station, you solve that actually by taking us out of the uh, place of safety uh, as a place of safety. But in the meantime, you know, we are stuck with these people who are vulnerable, um, who need a lot of care, a lot of attention, and all of that just soaks the police resource up. So the partnership approach, I think, has got far more sophisticated. I, I would argue um, that less forces would make it more efficient. Um, I think there's an issue around you know, our legitimacy is built on helping the citizen. That's why 120,000 cops and falling can please 65 million people or whatever we are now and rising because the vast majority trust the cops. They know we're here to do a good job and they, do, and they behave pretty well. They're self-enforcing. 
Um, but yeah, I think the partnership approach, I, 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 if I was a real chief, which I'm not anymore, rather irritated me, I'd be worried about saying, you know, if someone rings up and said we need help, I'm not going, is a bad place to be. Um, we have to manage that in different ways, which to some extent answers Peter's question around what if, if my bicycle stolen three weeks ago and I've been on holiday and left it out, I just don't want the cops to turn up. I want them to know about it mm. as an intelligence but I'm not sure I want them to turn up. Okay. Great, thank you. Let's open up to the floor. So if I can take three questions at a time. Um, gentleman at the front here. Before I was uh, into politics and as well as a councillor, I, I um... sorry, could you just say your name? Uh, my name is Mike Whitehead, I'm a councillor in East Yorkshire and I'm a PPC in West Holland Hazel. Um, I'm interested in what uh, Sir Hugh said uh, about size and uh, working together, the police being the, the last resort and, and uh, having to deal with problems of other services. In the NHS, actually emergency departments felt that they were the same, very, very similar. We need to get closer working relationships with all of the public services and isn't one of the ways that we could look at doing this is about them using shared physical facilities, mm -hmm. shared resources, and becoming much more integrated in the way that they provide operational care, operational service. Great, thank you, Mike. Gentleman here, just behind. Hi, I'm Andrew Allison, campaign manager for the Freedom Association. Can I just say on a parochial point, very thank you to Matthew for chipping in at the last minute and, uh, and giving such a, 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 a great speech. And he, he is also my police and crime commissioner as well. Um, look, look, just just quickly, I mean, I mean, Labour want to go back to the whole police authorities business and, uh, again, God help us. I mean, the whole thing was corrupt. I mean, he, I mean, he was just used as sweeties by a council leader to say to a councillor, you've done a really, really good job. There's an extra £10,000 on, on, on top of it, but I think it's just important that police and crime commissioners do get out there, do connect with the public, and you two certainly do that. But just basically, could you just elaborate, both of you, on what you actually do to, to, to really connect with the public? Great. And the gentleman with the... Uh, thank you. Hi, I'm Councillor Tony Woodcock from PU. <laughs> um, I really fan of uh, PCCs. I think it's the only way to make the police force accountable. No other way to do it. However... Um, I'm not a fan of the fact that so many police and crime commissioners are members of a political party. I don't know how you do it, but I really don't like uh, party politicians or local politicians standing as police and crime commissioners. Um, I'd like to hear the panel's view on that. And secondly, I think Matthew has already said, at the same time as electing a police and crime commissioner, and we're very fortunate in Dorset, we've got an, um, an independent uh, police and crime commissioner and didn't he make the Conservative candidate look sick? Because they can get out all their party political machine to back the person that they think they think is the right person, not what the people think is the right person. And at the same time, and I think we ought to have um, uh, elections for the police and crime panel, because they tend to be a cronies paradise as well. Party political people say, oh yeah, you know, this person's done a good job for the party. Shove them on the police and crime commission <laughs> panel um, and they get an extra, an extra handout. Okay, thank you. So let's take the first question. Um, Sir Hugh, probably best to place to us. In terms of the um, Last resort for policing. Mental health is obviously a massive issue and has been raised quite considerably both by the Home Secretary and I know that Irene Curtis from the yeah. Superintendent's Authority is a big issue for her. Um, but broadening it in terms of, of other resources that are being, being drawn from policing structure, a problem? Well, I know, I'm all for, uh, there's lots of all sorts of radical things we go on around the country now around sh exactly that, shared services, shared buildings. Um, you know, so the blue light service is being one, but, I, but far wider than that, you know, working with councils, you know, the, and I've no difficulty with that, I think that makes sense, and the more we can drive the money out, the more we get people working together and sharing, you know, if there's downtime in, you know, radically in the fire service, you know, there's not many fires for that anymore, people don't, houses don't catch fire anymore, so how, you know, can we use any of that resource in a different way for the American system, of course they're paramedics as well, so any sort of radical thinking around that, I have no difficulty with at all, and chiefs are working in, in some areas, there's some quite innovative stuff going on actually with PCCs and chiefs working together. The sticking points, frankly, coterminosity remains an issue. Um, hugely frustrating about trying to get the right people in the right room who will actually say yes to doing something rather than, well, that's not quite mine, it might be over here. So the more 
you can get co-terminosity, the better and more likely it is to be efficient and more quickly put into place. Brilliant. And before I come to the Police and Crime Commissioners to answer your own question, um, it would be interesting from you, Peter, to find out what your view is in terms of Police and Crime Commissioners. Is there a problem when they sit within a political party? At the outset, there was a debate as to whether or not, um, and, and this was in Parliament, both in the Commons and the Lords debate, whether or not political parties should, sorry, could, let alone should, uh, put forward candidates. I know that the Conservatives waited a fair long time before they even decided they were going to badge people as their candidates. The Liberals... Uh, said they would not put up candidates, they would support independence, and some very yellow coloured independents emerged from that process. In terms of Labour, um, it is the case that um, uh, they selected largely, and you were up against one of them, largely upon union block votes, didn't they, Matthew? John Prescott got the unison out in droves for their postal ballots. I agree with you entirely, uh, Councillor. Interestingly, I was a sergeant in Pool many years ago. Um, but the, the, the point I would make is, I really don't think you're getting, going to get away from having politicians, because they are, let's get over it, they're politicians doing a political job. You're going to have politicians who don't align to a political party. Because I could go outside there and pretend not to be a Conservative, as my wife said when I first said I was going to join the, the Conservative Party after years in a politically restricted post, she said, well, that won't come as a surprise to anybody who knows you. <laughs> so, you know, if it, if it looks like a duck, it's possibly a duck. And, and, you know, they're Conservatives. Let's live with it. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean... I, let, let's absolutely clear about this. The public of this country were not sure, in fact they probably didn't want police and crime commissioners, but I and I think pretty well every other police and crime commissioner candidate recognised they were absolutely of one in saying they did not want over party polit politics being brought into British policing and all of us uh, of Labour, Conservative, I think we have heeded that and we've conducted our, ourselves in a way to respect that. And do you uh, focus hard to make sure that politics doesn't uh, abs sit in. Uh, absolutely, in that I spend a lot of time out with Labour councillors, Labour MPs. I am not interested in their party membership. Um, they represent the same residents that I re represent. They are our rep uh, residents. And I will work with anybody of any party, any, you know, any colour, um, to, to do what we can to improve the lots of our residents. Brilliant. Katie, uh, let's just, yeah, let me perhaps just you could address, that. could you address the issue in terms of what you actually do to engage. Yes, but just let me pick up on this as well because um, this was a challenge that was uh, really at the forefront of our elections. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody that tells you they're independent of politics is lying. lying. Yeah. Okay, um, I've, I've lived long enough to understand that now. Uh, there, nobody is independent of politics. What they're independent of is the political parties that are on offer at the yes. time. They didn't want to be badged by any of those political parties, so they form their own. And that's fine, because we're in a democracy. But if anybody says, I am independent of politics, they are lying to you. Now, in Sussex, there are 1.6 million people, of which about 900,000 are registered to vote. When they go into the polling booth, despite the fact, I mean, Matthew and I are probably the two most two of the most visible, for the right reasons, um, PCCs in the country, <laughs> because we engage. Um, when, when, when I've got people in Sussex, they'll go into the election in 2016, they will not know me. I will not have had the opportunity to meet them, despite the fact that four or five nights a week I'm out at public meetings speaking to people. I maybe, if I'm lucky, will actually personally, physically speak to 60,000 in those four years. I will not be... T but what they will see is they'll see Katie Bourne Conservative, and they will know that I bring a certain set of values to that role. So when they make their mark, that helps inform their decision. But do be under no illusions. We do not put politics into policing. That is such a fallacy. I work with Hampshire, with Kent, and with Surrey, and they all have independence. I can tell you exactly which way, politically, they all vote, um, and uh, whether they eat onion relish or not. Um, 
I'll leave that one out there for you to work out. I'm sorry, we're not whipped, let's, 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 let's take two more right. questions, two more final you wanted questions. wanted to know about the, the engagement. The gentleman at the very back with the orange top. He wanted to know about the engagement, didn't he? Well, hang on, let's take, two more, let's take two more questions. Have that <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, good evening. My name is uh, Chris, Chris Wendell. I'm a lo local constitutional activist and stuff like that. The question I want to raise is basically with uh, CQ rights. Uh, obviously, being an ex-chief uh, constable of the uh, former RUC or something like that, what is the bureaucracy level now within the uh, police, police service of Northern Ireland? Are they just literally as, as what people might perceive as... Uh, Jerry Kelly's boot boys, or is there another level of bureaucracy uh, that comes in between that? <laughs> okay, sorry, just one more final one for the gentleman down here with the striped shirt, striped jacket. Hello, I'm Tony Baker's translator. Um, Tony Baker, who is an ex police officer, and he'd like to ask what do the panel think about the idea of moving to a single national police force? <laughs> All right, so, so very quickly then, very quick answers, because we are right on the time. Suki? Uh, uh, thank you for the easy question. I think you're referring to either policing board in Northern Ireland, uh, 19 people, uh, not directly elected, 10 were elected or nominated by the parties on the whole principle, so roughly mirrored the um, population. That meant I had some interesting people holding to me account and asking me about my human rights record. My human rights record. Well, that's democ it's the point is, that's democracy. Um, yeah, Jerry Kelly, um, well-known and self-declared IRA man, was on the policing board. I have truly been held to account by a terrorist. Very strange world. Well. But in the broader sense of the place, it was, the right, it was the right way to go. And frankly, with 19 people, nine of which were independents nominated by the Secretary of State at the time, you got a sense of sort of check and balance. And just a final point, and, but I, and I always remained operationally independent, fiercely. I was operationally responsible, though, which is slightly different. Uh, it meant everything was my fault, I think. But, you know, I was fiercely independent. And the other balance here, which wasn't touched on, of course, chief constables are operationally independent. Now, that's a proper conversation, as grey areas and all of that, but there are some checks and balances. Um, very briefly on the other one, the, the dissenting view in 1962 by Dr Urquhart was for a national force of regional commissioners. He was a man ahead of his time. I wouldn't go as far as national force. I don't think... No. I think that's a step too far for this country... I think you can get, there's a middle area that reflects the reality of the policing threats we now face. Great, thank you. Peter? Um, I, I, I just on the, on the what Sir Hugh said, just very quickly, I watched with pride in, what, in how Sir Hugh handled the transition of the police service of Northern Ireland. I thought it was an outstanding command. Oh, you the, the, um, the, the National Police Service, I think that no politician will want to go into a discussion about cap badges. Um, you see the cap badges discussions that happen in the Commons about uh, military regiments uh, that will be writ large by every village um, across rural England. Um, I have some sympathy to the point of view from, um, if you like, the very specialist police services, and I suspect the commissioners will mention that, but equally from the point of view of local neighbourhood policing, that needs to be have, have local democratic accountability and a local chief officer, chief constable who's running it. Okay? So That's Peter, the way just to deal with it. Yes or no? Would you like to no see national? That? No national. Yeah. And in relation to you, we, we really are on the. No national? No national? No, public don't want it. That's not the message that I get back from the public. A absolutely not. Policing needs to be done with communities, not to them. Yeah. If you had a national force, it would be delivering to them. Yeah. It would be unaccountable. They wouldn't feel part of it. We need to build a big team yeah. to confront criminality and make our communities safe. And the most important members of that team, apart from the police, are the public. Brilliant. Okay, well, listen, thank you very much. Thank you for the, all the panel members. I think that they, uh, they certainly showed passion in terms of the work that they do and the way that they spoke about it. Um, and future of policing, certainly with the members panels up here, it looks bright with them. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time. <laughs>